Hello, folks. Welcome to The Really Real Deal. Uh, this weekend, we're celebrating uh, the life and legacy of the late Reverend uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, so we're going to share a little bit about that with you today. And also, I want to share my thoughts on uh, our new um, team of leadership in my home state of Virginia, uh, our new governor, Glenn Youngkin, our new uh, lieutenant governor, my dear friend, Winsome Sears and our new Attorney General uh, Jason Miyaris and uh, a great team. We had uh, a lot of festivities, uh, honored to be able to attend uh, some of those festivities, inaugural balls, the, uh, the inauguration, the inaugural parade. Uh, so uh, seems like a, a, a new, a fresh new beginning uh, at the political leadership level of Virginia with um, a governor, well, actually with all three of them, you know, I haven't heard a whole lot from uh, the attorney general, but uh, from uh, Governor Glenn Youngkin and from my dear friend Winsome Sears, uh, the both of them, not to, not to exclude uh, Jason, I just don't know with Jason, but, but with the governor and with the lieutenant governor, they are really, really strong Christians, and they, they are unafraid to put their Christian faith forward. And that is so befitting on the uh, anniversary of the birth. The uh, I think this is, what, 93, 94 years? Uh, oh, let's, let's check my notes here. Um, 93. Dr. King would be 93 years old uh, yesterday where he, uh, had he not been, uh, cut down by an assassin uh, at the tender age of 39. Uh, just imagine that a man uh, so accomplished and not even 40 years old. Okay. Old, old saying life begins at 40. <laughs> and uh, I mean, Dr. King, just uh, one of a kind, uh, or I should say very, very few like him. Okay. Very few like him, but uh, I do want to share some things and, um, about his life and uh but i did want to just start out with uh a kudos uh, you know i thought uh the the um inaugural went well the inaugural speech uh, it, uh governor yonkin seems to be inviting the spirit i was blessed to attend the prayer breakfast uh yesterday morning at the jefferson and uh, listening to him, uh, you know, the type of people that he has around him. And uh, he actually led the closing prayer himself. OK, typically they would invite a minister to do that. OK, he did have a minister uh, do uh, a prayer. Um, uh, matter of fact, Cal Calvin Duncan, OK, from from my alma mater, VCU. OK, uh, he's a minister now. And so. Uh, he did uh, do a prayer, uh, but then uh, to close things out, um, it came down from the uh, grandstand uh, down to the level where the people are and, and did a prayer. OK, and so and I just I just think that you can never go wrong when you invite the Holy Spirit into whatever it is you are doing. And, and I say it's a, that's appropriate for Dr. King you know, for several reasons, okay? Now, the most important reason is that first and foremost, Dr. King was a man of God, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., okay? Not just MLK, not just Dr. King, but the Reverend, okay? And he was one to be revered. He was a, a man who revered God himself. Okay. And I'm not saying the man was perfect because last time I checked, God didn't make but one of them. Okay. One and only one and all the rest of us. Okay. And that includes uh, Dr. King. That includes me. That includes uh, Glenn Youngkin. That includes Trump. That includes all of us. That includes Joe Biden, all of us. Okay. Um, Book of Romans <laughs> says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That's what it says, okay? So I'm not saying that the man was perfect, okay? And so I don't want any, uh, I don't want any nasty grams typed in here, uh, 
uh, about them. Every now and then you get one, but you know, you, you analyze anyone's life uh, ad infinitum and you can find something. You analyze me, you can find a whole lot more than with Dr. King, okay? You'll find more than with Trump, okay? So please don't overanalyze me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but but uh, the the spirit that Dr. King was was putting forth was that uh, you know he was helping America live up to her greatness. And his uh, famous speech, "I Have a Dream," he spoke of um, the the uh, founding documents being like a check that America wrote. And he wanted to help America cash that check. Okay. Brilliant writing. Okay. Br well, brilliant because it's rooted in truth. Okay. It was not uh, a clever sound bite. It was rooted in truth. Okay. It was the, it was a promissory note and it needed to be cashed. Okay. And so, now, here we are at uh, the weekend of uh, Dr. King, and there are going to be all kinds of people are going to want to come forward, and they're going to want to claim the mantle of Dr. King, okay? And I am simply asking a question, okay? Dr. King uh, spoke of a dream, and now were Dr. King uh, able to come back and, and be a 93-year-old man and to just walk around and he wouldn't look like his 39 year old self. So no one would just be another old man. Okay. And so if this uh, 93 year old man were to start saying some of the things that the 39 year old man said, what would uh, the media say about uh, this, uh, this unknown person? Okay. What would the uh, intellectuals say about this unknown person? What would the politicians say about this unknown person? What would the preachers say about this unknown 93-year-old man who was walking around saying the things that the 39-year-old, the 38-year-old, the 37-year-old Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, okay? So he spoke of wanting an America in which his children could grow and be judged on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. So right there, all of, you know, the, the media, the intelligentsia, particularly the, the Negro intelligentsia, okay? People who are getting paid uh, $20,000 to do a weekend seminar at a, at a Wall Street company to tell a bunch of uh, white executives, why they're racist. Okay. And so, you know, you just write them a check and make all of your executives sit and listen to this nonsense. So you can, it's like, uh, the mafia. Okay. The mafia comes by and they break your window. Then they show up the next day and they say, well, Hey, you know, how'd you like to buy some protection insurance? Oh no, I'm fine. So you replace the glass. They, they break it again. Uh, and then they come back, well, hey, guess what? The price of that protection insurance just doubled, okay? Rather than $1,000 a week, we now want $2,000 a week. And so you fork over the protection money. And this is what Wall Street is doing. They're forking over protection money to all of these, these Negro agitation groups and these far left-wing neoliberal white agitation groups who are using racial differences to rub raw to create division and to tear this country apart. Dr. King would be appalled at that. The 93 year old unknown man who no one would know that this would be Dr. King now. Okay. Because if they knew it was Dr. King, they, oh, the great Dr. King. And if you don't believe me, you just wait till tomorrow on Dr. Martin Luther King day, all the speeches, OK, people that are, are adamantly in favor of a border side. Now, Dr. King was adamantly against a border side. But all of these are border side advocates. They're going to be singing Dr. King's praises. OK, these Negro preachers who push hatred and division and they're filling the heads of the young people in their congregations with racial hatred and antipathy towards white people so that. The preacher can get a financial benefit because, again, 
It's a, it's a, a mafia inspired protection racket. It's a scheme. It's about money. It's not about justice. It's not about righteousness. And so these preachers, the lies that they're going to tell, they're going to invoke the name of the, the late great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in support of all of this BLM, Black Lives Matter. Black lives don't matter in their border side wing of the hospital. Black lives don't matter in South Side Chicago. Black lives don't matter when the news reporter, oh, there's a shooting over here in South Side Chicago. And the, and the, and the news reporter, they rush on over there and, and they pull the camera. Oh, wait a minute. That's just two black guys. I, I thought, I thought a white guy shot him. Oh, no, no, no white guys here. And then they get in the car and they go back to the TV station. But that same TV station that will not report truth, because see, the ugly little truth is that man is inhumane to his fellow man regardless of race, regardless of creed, regardless of color. And also, man has great love, great respect for his fellow man. Regardless of his race, regardless of his creed, and regardless of his color. They are both within the span of humanity in abundance. Both extremes and everything in between. It's all there. And guess what, folks? You will find what you look for. Yes, you will. You will find what you look for. And so even though 4% of black murders are committed by whites, that 4%, that's what the media looks for. That's what the Democrat party, the party of the Ku Klux Klan, the party of a border side, the party of Jim Crow, the party of political lynching, the party of um, school segregation, even uh, current uh, White House occupant, not president, White House occupant Joe Biden once famously said back in the 1970s as uh, integration was just getting started. OK, I was one of those children who was bust from the slums of Newport News out to the Denby area in Newport News, which was like beautiful and had my face plastered in the in the glass of the bus, the window of the bus, just like that Cosby kid cartoon when they just the, when they portrayed how busing was perceived from the black point of view. I was one of those kids. I could not believe that neighborhoods could be so beautiful. Everyone's grass looked like a green carpet. I had never seen anything like that before. Was bust out to Epps Middle School. In Denby. I was one of those kids. And Joe Biden was a senator who said, and I quote, I don't want my, it was personal with him, his children. He said, I don't want my children going to school in a racial jungle. And these Pulpit pimp Negro preachers led black America to vote overwhelmingly the largest percentage of any demographic group in America, more than white America, more than Hispanic America, more than Asian, more than gay America even, more than any demographic group in America voted, at least it wasn't the 95% that Obama used to get, and it wasn't the 90% that Democrats habitually get over the last several decades, but it was still the largest delivery of a voting block in the entire United States of America. And this is not because Reverend Chickenfoot really fully comprehends, believes, understands that you know, Democrat policies are better for America. I mean, come on, a border side, you stay in your slum school, you can't go have public money to go to a private school. 
public money can go to anything else, it seems like. You know, public food stamp money can go to a public grocery store. There's no government grocery store. So you public money can be spent in a lot of places. Public money can be spent in a private hospital, Medicaid, Medicare. OK, but public money, that's their argument. Oh, we can't can't take public money out of the public school and send it to a private school. Oh, no, can't send it to a Christian school. And he claims to be a Christian preacher. Let me give you some Bible verses here. I'm hot today. I'm just getting started. I'm hot already. <laughs> OK, Book of Malachi. And that, this is for you, Reverend Chickenfoot. Uh, pulpit pimp preacher, and it's for the poverty pimp politicians also, okay? These Negroes, see, because I, I have to get it in today because tomorrow is Monday, the celebration of Dr. King's life, and these folks, they're going to be going crazy, okay? And uh, as a matter of fact, I'll be a guest on a WRVA at 9.05 tomorrow morning, so I'll get I'll get the really real deal uh, in for, for about seven or eight minutes. Okay. And so, uh, but throughout, uh, all of these programs, you know, all of these evil, wicked people, uh, they're going to be claiming the mantle of Dr. King. Okay. And, uh, and we, and again, I'm asking the question, what would the 93 year old Dr. King, you know, unknown 93 year old man, nobody knows he's Dr. King. What would his assessment be? Okay. And see, word of God, book of Malachi. See, Dr. King would be familiar with this. And now, O oh ye priests, see, talking to the preachers, okay? This commandment is for you. God, talking to the preacher, this is for you. If ye will not hear, if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you. I will curse your blessings. Yes, and I have cursed them already. Anybody ever wonder why there's in the black community, there's more churches per square foot than anywhere else in America? You can't go through a ghetto and not run into a church every on the corner of every other block. You can't do it. Word of God says, I have cursed them already. And then he gives a, a reason because the next word is the word because. Okay, this is book of Malachi chapter two. Read it for yourself. Okay, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, God says, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces. Okay. That's feces, if anyone doesn't know what dung is, okay? So God is saying he's going to give these folks a face full of crap, okay? He's going to corrupt their seed, okay? And so there's all this talk, you know, this great America where, you know, the black community is the, the one demographic that has, not to say all blacks, but let's just be honest, as a percentage, okay, you have a higher percentage of people in poverty, a higher percentage of homelessness, a higher percentage of fatherlessness, a higher percentage of underperformance, a higher per percentage, not 100 percent. There's, there's no demographic that is 100 percent bad or 100 percent good. So don't hand me that. Don't hand me that. OK, but when you look at since, you know, the government and all these poverty pimps, you the people that like to always have break everything down, hyphenated Americanism. OK, so let's deal with it. Let's deal with it. OK. And see, and I'm I'm claiming Dr. King as a as a reverend, as a Christian. OK, not as a black Christian, although, you know, he had brown skin like me. But Dr. King could represent all humanity. He didn't just represent black folks, okay? And I don't just represent black folks. That's why I resent that term. People call me a black Republican. I'm not a black Republican. I'm a Republican Republican. I'm a Christian Christian. I'm not a black Christian, okay? I'm so Republican that half the Republicans don't like me. 
because I stick to the Republican creed. And I'm the type of Christian where half the Christians don't like me because I stick to the whole gospel, not the half gospel. And if you do likewise, it would be just like our Lord and Savior told us it would be. He said, they will hate you for my name's sake. He said, the servant is not greater than the Lord. He said, they hated me first. They will hate you too. And this Dr. King's life proved that. Even black folks did not really care for Dr. King. After he got famous, everyone wants to get on the bandwagon late. But as he was struggling in the early years, even black folks, they didn't want to hear it. White folks did not want to hear it. Nobody wanted to hear it. But the man was sharing with us the word of God. St. Paul wrote, there is no black, there is no white. There is no male. There is no female. There is no Jew. There is no Gentile. For all are of one blood through Christ Jesus. See, we're supposed to be a new creation. And these little superficial skin color differences, they're supposed to melt away. And again, I asked the question, and I'm going to repeat this question throughout my sermon today. If the 93-year-old late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. could come back and wander around and observe the world we have created, now he laid the baton in our hands and he left to be with the Lord in 1968. And if he could come back and watch and you have political leadership quaking, they're so frightened to speak the truth on this subject. Wall Street executives, they're quaking. They're so frightened. The military, of course, we, we would not expect Wall Street we would not expect the military, you know, we would not expect the church. We would not expect institutions upon whom we have relied to be the guardrails of society, our police, our justice department. We would see these are the institutions that provide stability and a, and a guidance system. Parents, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. Long, long time ago, you, 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 you could rely on universities. You know, professors were looked up to. They were admired. Academia today is a joke. Hollywood today is a joke. In World War II, Hollywood made patriotic movies. The American was the good guy. And he went out and he defeated the bad guy. That was Hollywood. Look at them today. What would Dr. King think? Critical race theory. And they, they act like they're doing black folks a favor to teach young children that you are a perpetual victim and that white people are a perpetual oppressor unless they bend the knee and apologize for being an oppressor. I mean, give me a break. A little teeny five-year-old Japanese girl had no part in Pearl Harbor. A little teeny five-year-old white kid had no part in American slavery. Okay? A little teeny five-year-old African girl had no part in African slavery. Because, see, that's how slavery was. If African captured African sold them to Arab and Jewish middlemen who they then, so that's wholesaling, okay? Just like any other business, wholesaling. You buy wholesale, you sell retail. And so when the Europeans would come and they would go there, buy some slaves, I mean, and it was the same thing when with the root word of slave being the, you would go to Slovenia and you would buy a Slav, a Slav is a person from Slovenia. That's where we get the root word slave. 
It's not racial. But these Negroes will not teach you that. These Negroes want to teach you that it was white people against black people and, and it was for the specific purpose of racism. The only reason was they hate your color. It's nonsense. White folks will pay money to lay into a tanning booth to look like me. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> the, they criticize Donald Trump. They call him Orange Man because he's laying up in a tanning booth trying to look browner than he, he naturally is. Okay. I mean, you know, he might be that brown if it's, um, if every month was, uh, July. Okay. And he, and he could stay in Florida. He might be that brown, but not in January. <laughs> okay. So this is nonsense. And Dr. King would be appalled at it. Okay. He would be appalled at it. And we cannot say that Dr. King would be with them. And yes, I'm saying us and them. Let's not, okay, another Bible verse, okay? Because that's, that is childish to say that, oh, Dr. King just brought everyone together. Jesus didn't even bring everyone together. Dr. King's not greater than Jesus. No one can bring everyone together. This nation has never been together. No nation has ever been together. You always have different types of people. Always. You know, there's, oh, there's two systems of government. There's not a hundred systems of government. Governmental systems have a hundred different names, but they all fit into two categories. Government is either going to recognize and respect the fact that God created you as a free person and the government will try to limit itself to do that which is necessary to create structure, order, safety, and security so that you can do all of the, the things necessary to make society work, create prosperity, uh, invent things, deliver goods and services, okay? Or that's one system of government. And it, you know, you can call it many things that there are many politicians that adhere to that to varying degrees. But then on the other hand, you have fascism, you have Nazism, you have communism, you have socialism, you have Maoism, you have all these different types of governmental structures that are uh, top down and they do not respect that you are free. Okay. You belong to them. You do what you're told. And the people in charge, they can do different because the rules don't apply to them. All right? They can kill you if they just simply say, well, it's for the greater good. Because in that worldview, the end, they, they, they pretend righteous ends. And therefore, whatever the means are, it's justified. Why we're not murdering a hundred million people. We're merely, uh, we're creating a great big omelet. It's going to be for the greater good. And in order to create this great omelet, we have to break a million eggs. Okay. And I know that sounds crazy and I'm describing it to you because it fits. It fits. And if you think about it, this is what has been done throughout history. The millions of people killed by Hitler, the millions of people killed by Lenin and Stalin, the millions of people killed by Mao, 78 million, the most of all of these tyrants by Mao. Okay. The Democrat military wing in the United States of America was the Ku Klux Klan. Their, the, their murders are small compared to Stalin and Mao and all these, but it's, it's the same principle. Okay. They just the tool of lynching to inspire a terroristic fear. Okay. Which the, the Quran tells, um, fundamentalist Muslims to terrorize. It literally says that if they do not submit and believe terrorize them. Okay. And so all these different 
groups that believe in killing and murder in order to have power over people, that's in opposition to people who want limited government. You have two types of government. And the Democrat Party is of that second type. They want uh, control at the top and you and me at the bottom. And we are to do what we are told. All right. That, that was not Dr. King. Dr. King gave his life fighting that. But people who advocate for that, they will be claiming the mantle of Dr. King tomorrow. Yes, they will. And they are liars because Dr. King was not talking about promoting a particular race, racial group. He was not talking about demonizing. He didn't even demonize whites. Okay. He did not demonize anyone. All right. He truly was the apostle of peace. I'll give you a little bit of, um, oh, but let me close the loop on this thing of the uh, political murders of the Democrats against Republicans. They lynched, uh, they lynched uh, 1,300 white Republicans and they lynched 3,600 black Republicans. But it was Democrats lynching Republicans. It was not white people lynching black people. It was not just willy nilly because, for example, there was zero white Republicans lynching anybody. It was white Democrats doing the lynching because, again, the Democrat Party has always been about the powerful controlling the few. And if you get out of line, they're going to fix you. Now, today they can't lynch you with a rope. So they do what um, Justice Clarence Thomas, he called what they did to him, a high tech lynching for uppity blacks who deign to think for themselves. OK. They're trying to do that to my dear friend, Winsome Sears, who just got sworn in yesterday as Virginia's lieutenant governor. OK, they call her the black face of white supremacy and all other kinds of horrible names. Similar names have been laid at me for years and years and years. Um, we saw Larry Elder running for governor out in California. Uh, they said the same thing about him. This semi-literate bald-head Negro, he's a comedian. I forget his name. He has a radio show, and hes I think he does a game show. Thick, bushy mustache, bald head, uh, broken English. You know, sounds like he should have a mop in his hand or a broom or something. It does not sound like he should have a microphone in his hand, but he has one, okay? And he has a national... I wish I could remember that Negro's name, but he called this very fine gentleman... Very intelligent, very articulate, very accomplished. Okay. National radio host Larry Elder. He said the same thing about him that there's that that Joy Reed, Joyless Reed said about Winsome Sears. The black face of white supremacy. Okay. And so it really is about character. It's not about skin color. If it were about skin color, these uh, Black Lives Matter people, these Antifa people, these Democrat operatives, these uh, pulpit pimp Negro preachers, these poverty pimp Negro politicians, if it were truly about color, advancing people of color, as they say, they would champion me. I am a person of color, although I don't really claim that. All right. I live on character, not color. They would champion Winsome Sears. They would champion Larry Elder. They would champion um, Dr. Thomas Sowell. They would champion Clarence Thomas, Justice Clarence Thomas, the most prolific writer uh, in the history of the Supreme Court. He's written, uh, I think, about 700 opinions. And the second closest one to him was uh, the late uh, uh, RGB, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And she had 300 and something opinions. OK. This he's he's a truly, truly great man and he's demonized and he has brown skin. OK, just like Joyless Reed, just like the, the Negro um, comedian, Steve Harvey. I knew the Negro's name. I just <laughs> I just didn't want to say his name. He whose name I will not speak. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, 
you know, you have to laugh at these things. This this is some heavy stuff, folks. If we can't laugh a little, okay, you you know, everyone would just say, click, I've had enough hatchet, man, I'm with you, but I just can't take it. <laughs> we got to laugh a little bit. <laughs> but uh, But I think Dr. King, again, if Dr. King was saying the things in 2022 that he said throughout the 60s, okay, they would they would call him the same thing. They would call Dr. King the black face of white supremacy. That is what they would say. Because he's talking about character, not color. Read a little bit of Martin Luther King and we're going to um you know, I'm not going to hold you uh to and if you're wondering why, you know, brother Craig, why are you so hard on the black preacher? Okay, 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Okay? And so that's why, you know, in other places it says, um, be careful when you seek leadership because you will be judged by a higher standard. So I'm standing on very firm biblical ground to go after people in leadership. That's who Jesus went after. Okay? Jesus didn't go after the woman at the well. The woman who had, you know, all these different husbands and was currently living with the woman to whom she was not married. Jesus told her, I know about all that. And then he he read her mail to her. You know, the woman that was going to be stoned to death. You know, Jesus wrote something in the dirt and everyone had a stone in his hand. They dropped their stones. Because Jesus said, ye, ye who is without sin cast the first stone. And he told the woman, well, well, where are all these men who accuse you? And she said, they're gone. They're, I have no accuser. And he said, well, neither do I. So Jesus didn't go to accuse the ordinary person. Jesus went to the leadership, the leadership. The prophets of the Old Testament went to the king. A, uh, um, Elijah went to Ahab. Elijah didn't go to the to the uh, two women at the fence post that were gossiping and say, you know, ye shall not gossip. No, Elijah went to the king and said, the Lord God has sent me to you and he has told me to tell you what thus saith the Lord. That is what Elijah did. That is what men of God do. That is how Jesus went to the religious leadership. That is why I go to you, Reverend Chickenfoot. That is why I quote you the book of Malachi that says, O ye priests. It's the word of God. It's not the word of Brother Craig. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at yourself. You have access to the word of God. You think it doesn't apply to you? It applies to me. And this is how Dr. King would look at it. It wouldn't be, oh, you know, all these black leaders, I'm going to link arms with the black leaders. Dr. King is bigger than his brown skin. He was a humanitarian, not a black man. But black men and black women who are on the wrong side of history, they're going to claim him. And white people who are full of fear are going to let them do it and not going to call them account. So I have to do it. Now I want everyone out there to repost this, share this. I know Facebook and YouTube and all these little, um, whatever you call them, they make it hard. I know, but try, okay? Try to repost this. All right. Where are we now? We're still in the word of God. Second Timothy. Perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded. They stole the election from Trump. That's traitors. Traitors. All right, Reverend Chickenfoot. I'm at verse five now. 
Listen, this is you having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And now this next part is for you who sit in Reverend Chickenfoot's congregation. From such, turn away. I did not write it. I am reading it. It is from the book of 2 Timothy. It is chapter 3. Read it. From such, turn away. Okay? Now this is for our vice president. Verse 6. I did not write it. I'm reading it. For of this sort, are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. And this is for the intellectuals. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Second Timothy chapter three, verses one through seven. Read it, read it, okay? Now, um, a little bit of Dr. King. But there is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold with, which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place. Think of this folks, Me, this is me intersecting, okay? One second. Think of this in terms of the last two years, in particular, as summer before last, there were over 13 riots that were excused. They were excused by media, by intelligentsia, by law enforcement, they, they were excused, okay? 38 Americans lost their lives. Police were assassinated and assaulted. Thousands of homes and businesses were torched. One of the most beautiful boulevards in the entire world, it made the list, it literally made the list of the top 10 most beautiful boulevards in the world, right up there with the Champs Elysees in Paris, okay? Uh, which is uh, six minutes from my home, Monument Avenue, okay? Looks like a war zone. So, and this is Dr. King. I'm reading from one of his speeches, okay? And this is from the I Have a Dream speech. I'm just going to read one paragraph, okay? I'll start over with this paragraph. But there is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold, which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence again and again. We must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. OK, and so that's that's Dr. King. OK, that's Dr. King. So. A little bit of first Corinthians chapter 13. Verses one through 11, and I'm just going to read it. And this is one of the most beautiful passages in all the Bible. OK, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love. OK, you see, these, these people, they don't have love. This is why they could not listen to Dr. King uh, in our current time. 
they they could not they would they would have to call him the black face of white supremacy they would have to because we who uh live by the creed of dr king this is what they call us and they would call him that too if he was a 93 year old unknown man preaching what the same thing he preached as a young man okay love they have no love Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I've become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And although I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffers long. It is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunts not itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave itself unseemly. It seeks not her own. It is not easily provoked. It thinks no evil. It rejoices not in iniquity, but love rejoices in truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love's hope, love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Where there be tongues, they shall cease. Where there be knowledge, it shall vanish. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, last verse, folks, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And as we think about and as we celebrate the life of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I am inviting us to put away childish things. This, this notion that we can all just get along is childish. The word of God is full of people both in leadership and followers. You, you have these two different types of people. You have some who will, some who won't, some who love, some who hate. And it would be, it's a nice thought that we could just all get along. But we cannot all get along. The word of God says, how can light and dark walk together? Word of God says that. That's not Brother Craig. That's the word of God. Ecclesiastes chapter three. There's a time to love. There's a time to hate. There's a time to embrace. There's a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time to throw stones. There's a time to gather stones. There's a time to everything under the sun. Wisdom is knowing when to do what. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. And so the young Dr. King came as the apostle of peace, sharing what was possible. The 93-year-old Dr. King, if he were to come back and observe and see, okay, that, wow, in my absence, you know, I mean, some of these... Um, some of these pulpit pimp preachers and poverty pimp politicians, some of them were, you know, young men in their teens and 20s, you know, maybe 30s at the most when uh, Dr. King was among us. 
And for and for him to see, I mean, he might would want to reach out to them and say, hey, man, what are you trying to do? But he would certainly not be in agreement with them. And again, we we don't know how Dr. King would have evolved had he not been assassinated and he would have just naturally progressed to be um, 93 years old. You see, for us, the 39 year old Dr. King is cemented in our psyche forever because that's when he was cut down. So, but we would have to, we would have to give him credit that he would stay the course, okay? We would have to. We would have to assume that the 93 year old Dr. King would hold to the same principles that the young Dr. King held to. We would have to. And so, I'm, I'm accusing these people. I wrote an article uh, a few years ago, uh, Jacques, because also uh, the uh, anniversary uh, is of that famous letter by French writer Emile Zola, Jacques, uh, which uh, the Dreyfus affair, uh, uh, Lieutenant Alfred Dreyfus was a Jewish military officer in France who was accused of treason but he was accused of treason by people that actually committed treason. So you think this stuff with Trump is new? There is no new thing under the sun. And this man was sent to Devil's Island. And Emile Zola knew that it was wrong. And Emile Zola would not let up. And so he wrote this letter that was published in the newspaper. And uh, and it was, I accuse, Jacques. OK, and so I wrote this article several years ago when anniversaries collide. And so I converged the anniversary of the Jacques letter with the anniversary of Dr. King's birth. And so basically I accuse these uh, people who are going to sing the praises of Dr. King uh, of not living up to them, not only not living up to 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 uh, the things that Dr. King taught, but actually going counter you know, Dr. King believed in the life of the unborn. And these people believe in, uh, I mean, the Democrat Party loved uh, Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger uh, did uh, gave speeches to the Ku Klux Klan. She's seen in photographs with the Klansmen with the regalia on, the, the hood. If, if Margaret Sanger were alive today, I guess she'd give a speech to Antifa with the black hood on. What's the difference? You know, white hood, black hood, they still, they, they have to hide their faces because they know that they're doing evil. Okay, so, um, but go to my website, thereallyrealdeal.com and pull up the article when anniversaries collide and read that article. But um, anyway, I'm just going to have to let that uh, be the last word today. I've held you long enough. I've shared a little bit about you know, my thoughts and feelings on the passing of a great man. And uh, speaking of which, uh, my very first mentor, um, uh, Dr. Rayford Harris, passed a few days ago. And uh, uh, Dr. Harris uh, is, uh, law and, you know, and again, I hate to use the term black Republican, OK, because, you know, he's like a Republican's Republican. He was appointed by every Republican governor since Linwood Holton to something. OK, uh, he was actually the only professional educator on the state board of education when the standards of learning were implemented, which the teachers unions, they hated the standards of learning because it was the very first time that they were being questioned. They were being held to account. They were going to have to adhere to a standard. OK, and as imperfect as the standards of learning were, at least it was a standard. It was a beginning, a beginning of holding powerful people to account. Okay. But Dr. Harris was extremely influential in that. Uh, he was a graduate of Hampton university. He was a professor at uh, Virginia state university and just, uh, so well loved and well respected. Uh, he was my very first, uh, mentor. Uh, you know, I was a very troubled soul when I met him over 30 years ago. Okay. And we, it, it we just developed a really, really, beautiful relationship and he really became like the father that I never had <clears throat> and um, so I send my prayers and blessings to his family to Sonia Larita and uh, Rayford Jr. 
and uh, his homegoing service uh, will be uh, this Thursday at one o'clock at Scott's Funeral Home on Brooklyn Park Boulevard in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, his viewing will be uh, Wednesday from 11 to 7. And um, he was a member of the Omega Sci-Fi fraternity. So if uh, the uh, his fraternity brothers will pay tribute to him uh, Wednesday uh, evening uh, at 6. Okay, so uh, Dr. Rayford Harris and uh, a truly, truly great man, uh, extremely influential, on, and particularly on my life. I would not be here. Were it not for him, <clears throat> God bless you. And I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you, that the Lord <clears throat> would make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, and that the Lord would lift his countenance up upon you and give you peace.